Uh, let me uh, move on the, the next speaker, uh, Professor Jeffrey Long. So Professor Jeffrey Long uh, received a PhD degree in the chemistry from Harvard University in 1995. Then uh, now he's a uh, Judson King Distinguished Professor at UC Berkeley. Then his research involved the synthesis and physical characterization of the new material with a potential application in the sustainable energy and environmental limitation. And he has published over uh, uh, 385 publications and also uh, more than 87,000 citations. Uh, please welcome the Professor Long. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm very glad to be able to speak today. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a bit about our efforts to make uh, porous materials uh, that could uh, help with low energy molecular separations. And this is research that's uh, done within uh, a new institute called the Institute for Decarbonization Materials uh, at Berkeley. And it's mainly sponsored by the Department of Energy. And the interest uh, from DOE is in uh, trying to reduce the energy consumption associated with separations. So about 10 to 15 percent of global energy consumption and therefore about 10 to 15 percent of CO2 emissions are associated with molecular separations. And many of these are done by very inefficient means such as cryogenic distillation. Uh, and our goal is really to develop new porous materials that can enable low energy adsorptive separations. Uh, and in some cases, we'll build those into membranes for membrane based separations. Um, but what I want to focus on today is uh, the idea that the bar shown here uh, is really for traditional adsorbents, uh, such as zeolites, um, a, you know, porous uh, carbons, silicas, and most metal organic frameworks. Uh, but I want to introduce the idea that you can also do within MOFs cooperative adsorption that might dramatically lower the energy consumed in a separation. And, and so we tend to focus on uh, separations that are most energy intensive, leading to the largest CO2 emissions. Uh, and I'm going to start out focusing uh, on materials for removing CO2 from fossil fuel burning power plant emissions. And the materials we work on are metal organic frameworks or MOFs. These are essentially designer zeolites uh, where we can use the power of synthetic chemistry and coordination chemistry to control the pore size, the pore shape, and importantly, the surface functionality uh, of the material. And so that chemical tunability and atomic precision of MOS is very important, especially when it's combined with record high surface areas. So MOFs can have uh, the highest surface areas of any known material. And that high surface area means that if we have selective adsorption of a molecule uh, from a mixture onto the material, uh, then the MOF can have a, a very high removal capacity, a very high working capacity for removing that target molecule. And the simplest way you could envision using these materials would be in a fixed bed adsorber. And the idea is that you would pack a column with the some structured form of the MOFs. Uh, and you're going to bring in one end at one end the gas mixture. And if we've done our job right in designing the MOF, then just one molecule, the target molecule in the mixture, will stick to the MOF surface. And the other molecules will go out the outlet in purified form. And eventually you'll saturate the surface of the MOF and you'll need to switch to a new column and you'll desorb the target molecules that are stuck to the MOF by either lowering the pressure or raising the temperature uh, and start again. And so these materials need to do selective adsorption, desorption again and again and again. Um, and an important point here is that you want to be able to desorb the removed molecules with as little energy input as possible. And so most materials that you might put into such a system uh, show a Langmuir type adsorption behavior. And so at, under equilibrium conditions, uh, 
we're going to have a very steep uptake of the molecules, and then the curve will turn over as you saturate and coat the surface with the molecules. And in such a scenario, once you've loaded the molecules onto your material, whatever your adsorption condition may be, to then regenerate and remove all of those absorbed molecules, you either have to uh, go to extremely deep vacuum to get all the molecules off, or you have to drive to very high temperatures. And as you raise the temperature, the steepness of this Langmuir isotherm only uh, gradually uh, is reduced. And so even with a large temperature change, um, you're going to still leave most of the molecules on the material at the desorption condition. And if you were just to try and reimagine uh, the ideal shape for adsorption isotherms for a low energy separation, you wouldn't come up with Langmuir isotherms, but instead you might come up with sort of step-shaped adsorption isotherms. Um, and so this is indicating a material where at low pressures under equilibrium conditions, there's no adsorption. Uh, but then at some critical pressure and temperature, you go from no adsorption to filling up your material. And this vertical sharp step in an adsorption isotherm is indicating a cooperative adsorption process. And if you have that sort of behavior, uh, then if you can position the step properly, uh, you can fully load your material and then a small lowering of the pressure or a slight increase in temperature can take you from fully loaded to fully unloaded uh, with the molecules. And so this could have very large implications for reducing the energy requirement in a separation. And really the important thing here though is you need not just this step-shaped adsorption, but you want it to be selective, chemically selective adsorption of those molecules. And an example, a really important example that most everybody will be familiar with of this occurs in biology uh, with hemoglobin. And so hemoglobin is this amazing biomolecule that has four iron heme sites. And when oxygen selectively binds at one iron, it triggers a rearrangement that opens up access to the other three iron centers in the molecule. And so hemoglobin will simultaneously bind and release four oxygen molecules at a time. And that gives rise, instead of a Langmuir isotherm, it gives rise to a step-shaped absorption behavior. And this allows hemoglobin to go from fully loaded to fully unloaded with a very small concentration change uh, for local oxygen. And uh, nobody realized that this kind of thing was possible in a very dense system within a porous material until we serendipitously discovered it within a metal organic framework. And those materials were discovered in the context of us trying to make materials that would have a high capacity for removing CO2 from a flue gas coming off of a coal-fired power plant. And so the flue gas here, after removing NOx and SOx, is mainly composed of these four molecules, CO2, nitrogen, oxygen, and water, all of which are innocuous except for carbon dioxide. And so for carbon dioxide capture, it's really about what can we put in this box to remove CO2, let the other molecules go into the atmosphere, and then spit out CO2 in pure form for either sequestration uh, or re slash remineralization, uh, or potentially for utilization. And so in trying to find MOFs that might have a very high efficacy for removing CO2, um, <clears throat> we really wanted to take advantage of the difference between CO2 and the other molecules in the mixture. So if we look a little more closely at the flue gas here, the temperature is generally going to be 40 to 50 degrees C. It's a low pressure mixture, total pressure of one atmosphere or one bar. And that mixture is mainly nitrogen left over from air during combustion. Uh, it's about 15% carbon dioxide, saturated in water, and generally a little bit of oxygen left over from combustion. 
And so if we think about these molecules, really the distinguishing feature that can allow you to selectively remove CO2 is the fact that carbon dioxide is acidic compared to these other molecules. And we can use acid-base chemistry to remove it from the mixture. And so this is a very old technology. This is the way we do CO2 separations on massive scales currently. Uh, and it's to take an organic amine, a molecule like monoethanol amine, in an aqueous solution uh, and have that contact the flue gas uh, or CO2 containing mixture. And two of these amines will react with a single molecule of carbon dioxide to form an ammonium carbamate uh, in solution. And so generally that can be very effective for removing CO2 at say 40 or 50 degrees C. But then once you've saturated that solution with CO2, to get CO2 back off, you have to go to very high temperatures. And so you might desorb CO2 at say 140 degrees C. And that's taking very high value steam away from electricity production, and it will lead to a large energy penalty for the separation. Uh, and this is because of the Langmuir type absorption behavior of these solutions, which means that you're actually only taking a small uh, fraction of the CO2 molecules out of the solution when you desorb at 140 degrees C. So this is a technology that has been demonstrated at very large scales now uh, for removing CO2 from flue gases. And so a, a, an example is the Petronova power plant uh, outside of Houston. Uh, and here it was shown they could do uh, 5,000 tons of CO2 uh, sequestered per day, removed uh, per day. And that was shown, demonstrated for three years of operation. But you can see this is an enormous scale operation. Uh, it's, the scale is a little hard, but here, here for example, is a truck uh, in the picture. And so the MOFs that we uh, discovered cooperative absorption in are, are based initially on a very good type of MOF called MOF 74. And MOF 74 is produced by taking a divalent metal salt and doing a reaction with this benzene ring where you've got opposing hydroxyl and opposing carboxylic acid groups. And those molecules in solution will react uh, with the metal two cations. Uh, they'll release, it'll release four protons and the compact four minus organic anions then stitch the metal cations together into a honeycomb type of structure shown at the right. And so in this structure, uh, the width of these channels running through the MOF is about 12 angstroms across. And what's powerful about MOF 74 is every M2 plus cation has five oxygen centers from five different linkers, but the sixth site is an exchangeable solvent molecule. And you can even remove and coordinatively unsaturate that metal site uh, by heating under uh, reduced pressure. And so I want you to have a good sense of the, the structure here, but imagine that you're a molecule of CO2 in the gas phase flying towards a crystal of a MOF74 compound. Uh, as you approach the crystal, you might enter one of the channels running through it, and this would be your view. And in this image, uh, the green spheres are the two plus metal cations where solvent has been removed. And I want to point out that there are rows, there are rows of these metal cations running along the C-axis at each corner of the hexagonal channel. And those metal cations are about six angstroms apart as you go down the C-axis of the material. And what we're going to do for CO2 capture is we're actually going to attach a diamine, like ethylene diamine, to each of these metals. And that structure, the spacing, is going to allow us to polymerize CO2 into chains. Uh, and the first thing that we did here, though, was we expanded the channel a little bit to give us more room. As far as possible, you don't want to be kinetically limited for uh, diffusion of incoming and outgoing gas molecules. 
Um, and so to do that, we simply replace the central benzene ring on the linker with a biphenyl unit. And that leads to the same honeycomb structure type, but now the channels are 18 angstroms in diameter instead of 12. Uh, but we still have the same rows of metal cations running along each corner of each hexagonal channel. And for our purposes, we're going to actually use the magnesium cation uh, as the metal node within the material. So uh, the next step is to append a diamine. And so here is dimethylethylene diamine. And one end of that diamine will bind very strongly to the metal cation. And the other end can't reach another metal. And it's, it's uh, dangling on the surface of the material. And so if you take that material and absorb CO2 or nitrogen, here are the results. You can see you get a very large, uh, strong response to carbon dioxide at flue gas type conditions. Uh, and the heat of absorption here from those absorption isotherms is about 70 kilojoules per mole. This is a response very similar to, in terms of energy of absorption, to those amine solutions that I showed before. Uh, but this is very chemically selective. Only CO2 binds. Nitrogen and oxygen do not stick. Uh, and so it's very selective for carbon dioxide under flue gas conditions. But what was truly unprecedented is the fact that these are not Langmuir absorption isotherms. If we look at the low pressure region, you can see a very sharp step-like uptake of carbon dioxide. And nobody had ever seen this kind of response under these conditions uh, for CO2. And you can see also that as you raise the temperature, the position of that step rapidly moves to higher and higher pressure. Uh, and so we spent you know, quite, a quite a bit of time understanding the mechanism here. Uh, but the reason that you're, you know, we were so interested in that absorption behavior is that the step isotherm, as I said before, could enable a very large working capacity for a small temperature swing. Small temperature swing will translate to lower energy separation. Right? And so while amine solutions or other amine-based absorbents, uh, you'll only remove some small amount of the CO2 per absorption desorption cycle. With a stepped absorbent, we could do a small temperature increase and take out the full capacity of CO2 absorbed in the material. And so the mechanism for how this works is really very interesting. Uh, one good thing about moss is they're crystalline. And we can even grow single crystals of, in this case, this is the zinc form of the moth. Uh, and those single crystals, we can, uh, we can desolvate, we can attach diamines, we can evacuate, we can absorb CO2, we can desorb CO2. The single crystals survive all of that. And so here you see a slice along one of the rows of metal centers running along one of these channels that I showed you earlier. Uh, and you can see each metal has a diamine bound. Here's the bound end of the diamine. Here's the dangling amine. And when those, uh, when the material reacts with CO2, it doesn't just form ammonium carbamates using these dangling amines, but rather CO2 inserts into a metal amine bond. And that forms a carbamate anion which is bound via oxygen to the metal. And at the same time, you transfer a proton from the backside of this nitrogen to the dangling amine on the diamine at the next metal site down the channel. And the ammonium cation that you form uh, is attracted to the carbamate anion. And you can think of that, whoops, you can think of that as tugging on this metal amine bond, preparing it for and activating it for CO2 insertion. And so CO2 insertion will propagate, you'll insert, activate and insert, activate and insert. And the product that you get are these one dimensional ammonium carbamate chains, one of them running along each corner of every hexagonal channel within the moth. And that's fully reversible. When you desorb, you again see a sharp step uh, for the desorption of CO2, you're just simply unzipping 
CO2 from these one-dimensional chains. And so if we look at now a slice of one of these channels, you can think of this as just like hemoglobin, this material at a certain pressure and temperature, it all of a sudden goes from no CO2 loading uh, to really filling up and forming all these chains with carbon dioxide. And so this, instead of just four oxygen molecules for a giant biomolecule, here we have a very dense uptake of carbon dioxide uh, in this chemically selective fashion. Um, so knowing that mechanism gives us a great power to then uh, tune the thermodynamics of the reaction with CO2. And we would really like to be able to adjust the adsorption step, the conditions that lead to the uptake of CO2 to fit the uh, composition and temperature and pressure of the incoming CO2 containing mixture. And to do that, we have a number of handles. One thing we can change is the metal center, but there's only about seven or eight different metals we can put into the moth. Uh, more powerful, we can change the diamine. And if you change the diamine, you can impact, for example, the strength of this metal amine bond. And we're gonna break that bond to form a metal oxygen bond. So that plays into the thermodynamics of the reaction. You can also change the spacer between the nitrogens, and that will change the chain structure that you're forming. That will change the thermodynamics of the reaction. Or you can change uh, the substituents on this ammonium forming nitrogen, and that will change the energy of this ammonium carbamate chain forming interaction. All of these are knobs we can tune to move the step uh, for the adsorption of CO2. And so here's just an example. If we start with this very inexpensive magnesium-based moth, uh, we can look at four different diamines. All these diamines bind through the primary amine end. And as you build up steric encumbrance, you're changing that ammonium carbamate chain forming interaction, and you're moving the step to higher and higher pressures at any given temperature. And so by uh, understanding uh, these materials and varying the diamines, we're able to uh, really move the step all over the place. So we've tried more than 80 different diamines in this magnesium moth, and at a temperature like 40 degrees C, that allows you to push the step anywhere from two parts per million, uh, where you're removing CO2 from a very dilute mixture, uh, to out past two bar which might be a value for doing a, a separation for something that contains a high pressure of CO2. And so what we're doing as we're changing the diamine is we're changing also the thermodynamics of the reaction. And so here I'm plotting uh, along the horizontal axis, the enthalpy of CO2 adsorption, and the vertical axis is the entropy. And this is for a dozen or so different diamines, all appended to the same magnesium framework. And you can see we can change delta H anywhere from minus 40 kilojoules per mole to out past minus 100 kilojoules per mole. And as you go to the stronger and stronger enthalpic driving forces, uh, you're actually usually making more and more tightly wrapped chains, and you're paying a, a a higher and higher entropy penalty. And so these data tend to fall on this gray line. And we can move along this line, and moving along that line will we'll move the position of the adsorption step. And so, for example, if you wanted to capture from a coal flue gas and be able to remove 90% of the CO2 molecules from that incoming mixture, you'd want your step to be at 15 millibar. Uh, and that corresponds to the delta G for this green line. And so you can see here's a here's an adsorbent that's going to be really uh, well positioned for doing that separation. Um, and so these are materials that you can uh, absorb and desorb from again and again. Uh, here we're I'm showing the results from 1,000 adsorption desorption cycles, and we're absorbing from a simulated coal flue gas that's wet, so humid, uh, at 40 degrees C. 
and then desorbing with hot, humid carbon dioxide at just 100 degrees C. And so in a power plant, uh, if you can desorb at these lower temperatures, that's a huge advantage because the value for producing electricity drops as the temperature of the steam is lowered. And so 100 degree steam is, is not very valuable for producing electricity. And that's the steam that you'd like to use. That's the heat that you'd like to use for regenerating your adsorption bed. Um, so the ability to tune the adsorption behavior here can give us power to tackle different CO2 separations. There are many, many places where we need to uh, remove CO2 and we need to do it as efficiently as possible. Um, and, you know, the, the promise of these materials led us to start a company, Mosaic Materials. Uh, it's based here in the Bay Area. Um, and Mosaic really uh, was about learning how to scale up production in an inexpensive way of these moths and also to produce them in structured forms where you can create a, a mechanically robust film or pellet or other form of the moth. And so here, this is, this is 10 kilograms of, of one of these moths. And here's just an attrition test. If you're going to use pellets in a bed, you want to make sure that they're going to survive for many, many years and not degrade and pulverize. Uh, and so that company uh, was successful to the point that we, uh, we needed to, to uh, really move to deployment and large scale engineering resources. And so in April of this year, we, uh, the company was acquired by Baker Hughes and Baker Hughes is a supplier to the oil and gas and power industries. Uh, and they're uh, now looking to deploy this material, these types of materials, particularly for capture of CO2 from air and from a natural gas combined cycle uh, power plant. So one last point I'll make about these, and then I'll move on to other separations. Um, we have had a long-standing project funded by ExxonMobil uh, that was really about trying to do CO2 capture under extreme conditions, where we might capture at very high temperatures and regenerate then at even much higher temperatures. And one problem that you can run into is that at very high temperatures, uh, eventually you might desorb some of the diamines. And so the solution to this we had was to try and make tetramines that could still do CO2 polymerization. And so here you see a crystal structure of this particular uh, ethyl, ethylene diamine. And you can see the two ethyl groups on neighboring metals are leaning over towards each other. We thought we should just make a carbon-carbon bond here. And those tetramines could still allow cooperative chain formation. And so we can use a tetramine like this. And indeed, uh, these tetramines will actually graft into the material in an ordered way. And so here's a crystal structure uh, looking down on one of these channels. And you can see the amines, the tetramines, they're bound to two metals. And there's also even hydrogen bonding going on between them. But now these are exceptionally robust materials that can operate for CO2 capture under extreme conditions. So for example, we could capture uh, from a natural gas flue emission at 100 degrees C. Uh, and that's a temperature where you don't have water co-adsorbing to nearly the same extent. Uh, and then regenerate as, as, as high as 180 degrees C. And you can cycle these again and again without loss of uh, any of the tetramines. In fact, that can even enable direct steam stripping, which is sort of the holy grail for power plant uh, CO2 removal. Uh, you want to use low temperature steam directly to strip out the carbon dioxide. And uh, this is just showing that at least for some of the initial cycles that we were able to test, you can use direct steam contact uh, to remove the CO2. So just here's a cartoon to give you a better picture of what's going on here. Here's a crystal of the moth. We'll focus on one channel. You can see the tetramines grafted. It's going to rotate 90 degrees now. Looking down on the channel, here's the tetramines. 
And you actually form two different types of chains at slightly different energetics. And that leads to not a single step, but a double step uh, for the material. Once you've loaded with CO2, then you can then bring in steam, drive out the CO2, and start again. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I just want to give you a, a little taste of the possibility of, of doing cooperative adsorption for other molecules. Uh, and so now that we know this is possible in a dense way in a metal organic framework, we should think, can we design materials that would cooperatively absorb other molecules than CO2? So an obvious one perhaps is just simply carbon disulfide. Uh, and that seems trivial, but there is a trick to it. And the trick is carbon disulfide will react with the protons on primary and secondary amines. And so you need to use a primary tertiary amine like this one. And then the primary amine will bind to the metal and the tertiary amine can do, uh, can lead to cooperative CS2 adsorption without direct uh, uh, acid base chemistry with the proton. And so here again, we can form these polymeric chains incorporating this uh, adsorbate. Uh, and this can be selective, you know, so here's a lot of different gases. You can see at 75 degrees C, here's a step for C CS2. It's selective even against carbon dioxide. And so carbon dioxide will do cooperative insertion here, but it does it at much higher pressures under these conditions. Uh, and so again, the advantage is you can cycle at high capacity with a small, oops, with a small uh, temperature swing. Okay, but what about other molecules that we really need to separate on massive, massive scales at high energy costs? So what about oxygen, nitrogen, CO, ethylene, propylene, aldehydes, ammonia? How can we do those? Um, so one of the thing with the molecules here is none of these are acidic to the same extent that carbon dioxide is. So we can't use this acid base kind of mechanism. Uh, and so for each one, you have to think about how do I get chemical selectivity and how is that going to activate a neighboring site and how will that propagate through the MOF structure to allow cooperative, selective cooperative absorption. And so we did it intentionally for the first time with carbon monoxide. And what's special about carbon monoxide, as, as inorganic chemists know, it's really a strong field ligand on a transition metal, meaning it gives a strong preference for low spin uh, spin configurations. And, and so our idea was that we might use this as a means of gaining selectivity. So we wanted to build a MOF where we had high spin iron two with an open coordination site, uh, but the low spin configuration should be close enough in energy such that when CO binds, that will become the ground state. And of course, when you go from high spin to low spin iron two, the radius of the metal center shrinks slightly. And that response could then propagate through the structure, enabling cooperative absorption. And so the way to do this is we have to move away from these weak field oxo donor ligands. Uh, and we found that this, this bis triazolate uh, linker could give us again a honeycomb type material where we could expose iron two and the ligand field around iron two was such that high spin iron two was the ground state uh, in the absence of a six ligand. Here are the chains running down the C-axis of the material. Orange, these are the iron centers. And here's the open coordination site. But you can imagine if CO binds at one of these irons and it goes from high spin to low spin, the radius will contract. And that contraction will move all of these ligands in and will actually destabilize these neighboring two metals. And so what happens in this material is indeed in response to CO, a strong field ligand, you get this uh, really unprecedented step-like absorption behavior. Uh, whereas other molecules like CO2 or even ethylene or propylene give a, a Langmuir type weaker response. They don't 
drive the spin transition for the iron tube. And so again, these steps move rapidly to higher pressure as you increase the temperature, facilitating a, a large separation working capacity. And this is an all or nothing prospect, at least on the time scale of the experiments we've done. Uh, here, crystal domains, they're either all high spin iron two with no strongly bound CO, or when you get to enough CO concentration at the condition, you'll suddenly bind CO at every one of those sites and they'll all become low spin. And that's because all these metals want to be in either one structure or the other at the same time. And here are the crystal structures. You can see when we bind CO, the iron nitrogen distance, for example, shrinks from 2.17 to 2.00 angstroms. And so this then also can enable uh, this high capacity separation compared to traditional adsorbents uh, with a, a low regeneration temperature. Okay, uh, this spin transition mechanism we've been trying, we haven't yet managed to get it to work for other uh, pi uh, accepting molecules like ethylene or propylene, uh, but it's possible we can get the electronics at iron two right to work for them and, and maybe also acetylene. Um, oxygen, though, is a very interesting candidate. We know nature can do it in hemoglobin. There should be a way to do this within a metal organic framework in a very dense way to facilitate a separation. And so at large scale, currently, we use cryogenic distillation to produce oxygen from air. This is a very highly developed and, and optimized separation, but it's cryogenic distillation, which is extremely energy intensive. Uh, so for oxygen, if we think about it, it's mixed in air with nitrogen and argon. And the main distinguishing chemical handle, which is what hemoglobin uses, is it has a high electron affinity compared to those molecules, meaning it's easy to transfer an electron onto O2 compared to nitrogen or argon. And so that means if we build uh, MOFs that contain open coordination sites for redox active reducing transition metal like cobalt-2, uh, we can do electron transfer chemistry to make a cobalt-3 superoxide. That's exactly what's happening in this MOF. And you can see there's even a hydrogen bond going on with a hydroxide bridge uh, uh, in the MOF. And so this was a interesting um, for oxygen adsorption via an electron transfer. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not a positive cooperativity observed in this material. So if we look at infrared spectra, uh, what we see is that the OO stretch, as we load with more and more oxygen going to higher and higher pressures, uh, the oxygen-oxygen bond is becoming less superoxide-like and more O2-like, meaning it's going from a bond order of one and a half to towards a bond order of two. And this is because what's happening in this material is as we put more and more oxygen in, the bonding of oxygen is actually getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So the idea is that once we form a cobalt-3 superoxide, the affinity of a neighboring cobalt-2 for oxygen is going to be lowered. And that leads to not positive cooperativity, but the first example in a porous material of negative cooperativity. And so you can see the adsorption isotherms here. The purple curve is a standard non-cooperative Langmuir uptake. The red curve is a positive cooperativity, as I've shown with CO2 and carbon monoxide. But here with oxygen, we have a negative cooperativity. And that leads to this even steeper isotherm that then never quite saturates because you're getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And so negative cooperativity, it's not clear what we can do with this. Um, but it is observed, it's been invoked in nature for understanding insulin uh, regulation. Uh, and you can quantify sort of the, the nature of this cooperativity with a Hill analysis. This is from diffraction data, but a Hill coefficient of less than one is a signature of this type of negative cooperative behavior. Okay, in the last minute or two, uh, 
I'll just briefly mention we've recently succeeded in doing for the first time cooperative ammonia adsorption. This is of interest, for example, in Haber-Bosch synthesis of ammonia. So the reactor is actually very highly optimized. It operates, you know, not too far above the thermodynamic minimum efficiency. Uh, but it's one thing that's very energy intensive and leads to a lot of global energy consumption is actually trapping the ammonia, cooling and uh, having to then reheat the nitrogen and hydrogen that's not used and then recompress it. And so we're interested in adsorbents that could remove that and replace both the cooling unit and the compressor. And so it turns out that we can make paddle wheel based MOFs with copper two paddle wheels and these dicarboxylate type linkers. Uh, and we get rapid uptake and a stepped adsorption isotherm where we're now absorbing as much as four ammonia molecules per copper. And so we can follow this via crystal structures. It also leads to color changes as we go from carboxylate paddle wheel units to the tetra ammonia copper complexes. And this is fully reversible. You can do crystal to crystal transitions here uh, and go back and forth and back and forth. And there's even an intermediate uh, structure that forms. Uh, but the ultimate fate of the copper is to take on four equatorial stronger ammonia ligands and retain two of the carboxylate oxygens along weaker axial directions. And it turns out the hydrogen bonding that's being formed here plays into the energetics of this uh, absorption and leads to actually heat management in a separation. And so we follow these structural transitions back and forth, uh, but heat management could be really powerful here. We're getting a very strong interaction with ammonia, but it's being balanced by the copper oxygen bonds you're break breaking and the hydrogen bonds that you're forming. And so this is much lower heat involvement that you need to manage compared to what you'd normally expect uh, for something with such a strong interaction. Okay, I'm out of time. Let me just thank some absolutely brilliant students, postdocs, and collaborators, uh, as well as these sources of money, and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting and impressive presentation. Uh, also, you can refer the Q&A. Yeah, uh, let me select uh, some of them. Then thank you, Professor Long, for exciting lecture. The zipping mechanism for CO2 absorption in the diamine involved MOF is uh, very interesting. Based on this mechanism, would there be a preferred orientation for the alignment of the MOF, the crystal, so with uh, the incoming CO2 gas, or is this negligible? Yeah, so here the pore sizes are quite large, but uh, it's true with a with a one dimensional channel structure. Ideally, you want any time CO two encounters a crystal surface, it can find a, a pore to enter. But if you have crystals that are long one dimensional needles, that might not be the case. The CO two might have to enter through one end of the needle, uh, and so it is definitely of interest to find a way of making the material so that you grow. Uh, squat, uh, even plate-like forms of the crystals instead of these long needles. Uh, and there are ways to do that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. And second question, I would like to ask you the desorption behavior of diamine group toward the CO2. Does it associate more energy barrier for desorption process due to the strong binding of CO2 with the diamine group? Yeah, I think... So I think maybe this is asking about an activation barrier for the reaction with CO2. And it can be quite dependent on the diamine that you attach. And an activation energy is translates to adsorption, desorption, hysteresis. Uh, and in the ones in the examples I showed you, there's very little hysteresis, so almost no activation energy barrier. Uh, but with other more encumbering Diamines, we have seen scenarios uh, where you have a large, much larger hysteresis for adsorption and desorption. Uh, and of course, for the purpose I've, I've focused on here, a separation, we always want to try and have a, a, a very little hysteresis if possible. 
Okay. And the last question, I'm wondering how fast your mop can absorb the CO2. In other words, uh, is, is the CO2 separation rate of your mop comparable to the tra traditional uh, tra traditional the solution-based CO2 separation? It's much better because, so if you think about it, liquids, you know, you have to make a thin film of the liquid on a liquid contactor. Liquids minimize uh, surface area. And so the gas li liquid interface is, is really uh, slows down absorption. That's the advantage. That's one of the big advantages of porous materials. You can have a very large gas solid interface allowing rapid access of the CO2 to absorption sites. Um, but at the same time, some porous materials have small pore windows, and that can limit diffusion of CO2 in and out. One of the design principles we used here was to have uh, 10 angstrom wide channels. Even after grafting the diamines, we've got a, a 10 angstrom gap to allow rapid diffusion of, of gases in and out of the material. Okay, so thank you. Then I would like to thank the Professor Jeffrey Long for excellent presentation and great contribution. Thank you. Thank you.